So good morning, everybody. Today is Resurrection Day. Today is an exciting day, not just on our church calendar and not just because of what it means, but today is an exciting day because it is another Sunday where we gather and celebrate the risen Lord. We're hyper aware of his resurrection today, but, but it is not the only day that we celebrate the risen Lord. And so I wanna to start today by sharing with you not just a celebration of the wooden cross from Friday and the empty grave on Sunday and how all of that is the focal point of our celebration today. I want to continue what we started the last previous weeks. We ended last week. So we've been going through our Hebrews series and we finished the book of Hebrews last week. And Hebrews was a really fascinating book because what the author did in that book was make much of Jesus by sifting through the treasures of the Old Testament. He reached way back down into the Old Testament and he drew out these texts and these scriptures and he showed us how they pointed to the supremacy of Jesus of all things. And I thought, no, what better way to spend Easter than to continue making a big deal about the supremacy of Jesus by continuing to mine the Old Testament. So with that in mind, what I wanna do is I wanna start in John chapter three today. And at the end of John chapter three, Jesus in this conversation brings up something that may be familiar to some of us, may be foreign to some of us, but is a really important illustration about this weekend. So if you're up for it, Let's go. If not, as soon as I look down to read, you can make a quick exit and no one will see. <laughs> John chapter three, let's go to verse one. This may be familiar to some of you. If it is, you're gonna have a good time reading through it again with me. John chapter three, verse one, it says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, the Pharisees was, they were a group of, you could think of them as religious leaders within the Jewish community. They were like lawyers. They were hyper fixed on law and making sure everyone did exactly what they were supposed to be doing. And this man, his name was Nicodemus. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher from God because no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus says, Nicodemus, I, I see you and I'm gonna raise you. I see that you are affirming what I'm doing and the miracles that I'm working. You, you see it but I'm gonna make a statement that that's as far as it's gonna go unless something else takes place in your life. You will never move beyond just seeing the works of God around you unless you are born again. And this blows Nicodemus' mind. In verse four, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? That's a valid question. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, what is he talking about there? He's saying that unless a person is born of water, flesh, blood, unless a person is physically born and exists in a human body and then also born again in the spirit, they cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, why is that, Jesus? Verse six, because that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Those of us who have been born and we're living in a physical body, there is something more being offered to you from Christ. Maybe you were born into specific situations and, and your life didn't pan out the way you wanted it to be. 
Or maybe your life has gone completely peachy, everything is fine. The offer is the same to the person who hates their life and the person who loves their life. You can come to Christ and get a new life. And when you get that new life, there's new desires, there's new passions, there's new purpose for everything. But Jesus says, do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. That's not actually even the most fascinating thing about this conversation, Nicodemus. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. What he's saying there is not that born again believers, they make no plans and you can't tell where they're coming or if they're gonna show up on time. What he's, I guess that's some of us, but what he's saying there <laughs> is that those who have been born again have the same kind of impression in our lives that the Spirit has on this world. You can't prove faith, but you can see it in the lives of the people around you. You can't see wind, but you can see when it shakes the leaves and moves the trees. The evidence of God working among his people is the reason why Nicodemus has come to talk to Jesus this night. I see the miracles that are working, but Jesus is saying, but you're not actually seeing what they're pointing to. Nicodemus, verse nine, says to him, how can these things be? He has completely just blown his mind. I don't understand anything you're talking about. And Jesus answered him, aren't you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Aren't you supposed to be a subject matter expert on all of this stuff I'm talking about, but why are you coming to me? How come you don't get this? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen. That's a call back to verse eight, this idea that when the Spirit is moving, there's evidence, and Jesus is bearing witness that there is evidence that God is working, but you do not receive our testimony. So you can see the evidence that the Spirit is moving, you can see the leaves shaking, but you don't want to hear what we have to say. You affirm that God is moving, that he is real, that he is doing something, but when he demands something of your life, you don't have ears for it. You don't want to listen. And not only that, you're a teacher of the law, so you should be instructing people on how they're supposed to interpret this movement of the Spirit, but you don't even understand any of it. Verse 12, I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe. So how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So a religious expert comes to Jesus, his name is Nicodemus, and he's coming to Jesus at night, and he's affirming the miracles that Jesus is doing and saying, I can see the Spirit working. And Jesus tells him, you may be able to see the Spirit working, but you're not seeing what the Spirit is doing because all of these miracles point to something. Every miracle that has ever been done, when God breaks the rules, the earthly rules that we all live by, every miracle that has ever happened where God said, um, I know this is how things work, but I'm gonna break it. That's a miracle. Every miracle that has ever been done by the hands of God has always had one purpose, to point to something else. And if you think about it, the child that Jesus raised from the dead, someday in that child's future, that child died again. The people who were sick and raised up into new life, at some point they died again. So what's the point of a miracle if we're all just gonna end up in the ground because the miracles aren't pointing to a miracle, the miracles are pointing to something much greater. That's what Jesus is driving at. Jesus came to bring a much greater healing than just making our bodies work the way that they were supposed to be created to work. So when you see this person who's 
who's, who's lame or, or can't walk or who's blind and we're told that Jesus spit into the mud, rubbed it in this person's eyes and then they can see again, that was great. But what is the point of Jesus showing the world that he has the power to give this person the ability to see? Because what he's saying is he can't, he doesn't just have the ability to give this person the ability to see, but he's giving this person the ability to see, really see, see his life in a way that he's never seen his life before, see his value value system in a way that he's never seen it before. See the world and all of the creation in a way he has never seen it before. Only Christ offers a new way of seeing. Every miracle points to this greater miracle that is Jesus bringing the good news to mankind that he can heal you of your disease. Not, not your physical, not, not the cancer. He does have the ability to heal that but the goal of healing is not just so you can be free from that sickness. The goal of healing is to get your eyes on the king. And he's telling Nicodemus this, and he says, look, look, I know this is a lot, man, but let me just kind of break this down for you. Like everything that we're doing, we're testifying, but you're, like, you're getting it, but you're not really getting it. And you're supposed to be the one who really does get it but you don't, and I'm gonna to prove to you that don't really get it. Because Nicodemus comes to him at night and he thinks he has the moral high ground, but like, like we affirm, I'm gonna give you some, I'm gonna give you, we know you're a rabbi, you're a good teacher, uh, we know you're working miracles, and Jesus is like, no, you don't get it. Like I'm more than just a rabbi and I'm more than a guy who works miracles. I'm the son of man that, that has been prophesied that would come, that would bring redemption to the world. I'm God. And I'm going to prove to you that you missed it. And so what he does is he quotes two Old Testament scriptures. The first one is found in verse 13. He says, um, no one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Now that is a brief, short, first sentence quote from an Old Testament scripture, Proverbs 30, verse 4. When Jesus quoted this to Nicodemus, it would have triggered in Nicodemus' mind the rest of the verse. That's not quoted here, but I want to show you what it is today. If you put Proverbs 30, verse 4. When Jesus says to Nicodemus who has ascended to heaven, this is what Nicodemus would have been thinking because this is the verse that he quoted. Nicodemus was a smart guy. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment and who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? Surely you know. Clever Jesus. See what he did there? He quotes the first part knowing that Nicodemus will be triggered into thinking the third part and the question is inherent in verse 30. No one has ascended into heaven. He's asking Nicodemus, surely you know who I am. You're a teacher of the law. Shh, say my name. You don't know it? If you really don't know it, here's another scripture that frames out why I'm here. Verse 14, it says, as Moses lifted up the servant, serpent, excuse me, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, this second verse is a summary of a story. And this story is where I want to spend a little bit of time today. Jesus is telling Nicodemus, there's more to that story in Numbers 21. And as a teacher of the law, you should understand what that story is about. But clearly, since you're only seeing the miracles and not what they're pointing to, let's do a little Bible study. Because the foreshadow of verse 14 is a foreshadow of Jesus and the Easter events that we are here celebrating today. So what I wanna do is I wanna go in and read through Numbers 21, it's a couple verses, it's only verses four through nine, but before we do, I have to give you a little bit of a, a little background uh, in case you're unfamiliar with what's going on. So you're probably familiar with this guy named Moses and the children of Israel and that they were set free from the bondage of Egypt and they, were, uh, they saw some pretty amazing things, Red Sea parting, they're coming up on the mountain, there's fire on the mountain, there's 10 commandments, they make, they're made a people um, and then they're brought up to what is the promised land and they don't have enough faith that God would lead them into the promised land and God is like, oh, I've had enough of you. And God says, because of your unbelief, you're gonna wander in the wilderness for 40 years. 
Well, we pick up our story today in Numbers 21 at the end of that wandering. Numbers 21 is the very end of that 40 years. Aaron has died, Moses is close to death. A new generation has raised up and they are on the verge of the book of Joshua. Just a few chapters later, what's gonna happen is they're gonna come right up on the Jordan River and they're gonna cross over into the promised land. So this is the new generation. There's a lot of anticipation as you're reading through the story of Israel. Are these kids gonna be like their parents? Are they gonna be better than their parents? Are they gonna be worse than their parents? These children have never known a home. They grew up in the desert. They've been wandering for 40 years. The only thing they've ever known was eating manna and dove and water that pours out of a rock. And they're they're about to enter into the promised land. They're coming out of their wilderness wandering and they have one more final test. Now, if you go way back into the book of Genesis, there's a story between this guy named Jacob and Esau. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but essentially it was two brothers. They were struggling with one another. One was a little more deceptive than the other, took the birthright and the blessing from his older brother Esau, and they had a bit of a split. But even after the split, these two brothers were family. Jacob's descendants became the descendants of Israel, and Esau's descendants became the descendants of this tribe called Edom. And God commanded Israel, while you're wandering in the wilderness, you may have a dust up with a couple other tribes, but you don't fight with your brother Edom. The problem is Edom was a little stubborn. And when it was time for Israel to go into the promised land, Edom said, you can't travel through our area, our our land. Let me show you what the map looked like. (sighs) I love that you love this. So what you're looking at here is the Sinai Peninsula. Israel's up here, this is the Dead Sea region. We pick up the story in Numbers 21 at this mount called Mount Hor. This is where they've been traveling around. They've also kind of wandered down in this region, but this is essentially the wilderness region they're wandering in, and it's time for them to go take the promised land. They can't go directly up because these are all Canaanite strongholds. This is the land they're supposed to take. So they have to go around and come in this way. This is the way God instructed them. But they were told by their other family tribe, Edom, you can't go through our land. We like you, but we don't like like you. So you've got to go around us. So this is the contention that we see in Numbers 21 when we start reading. The children of Israel are this blue line traveling, and they have to go all the way around Edom, up through Moab, and right here is where they're about to cross over. That's where we start up in the book of Joshua. So keep that in your mind when you see the struggle and the frustrations that rise up in the people of Israel as we go to Numbers 21. Numbers 21 says this, when the Canaanite, uh, excuse me, verse, we'll start in verse four. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom and the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke out against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, there's no water, and we loathe this worthless food. I thought you said there was no food. Now there's food and you just, okay, you don't like the food. So this is what the Lord did. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, we've sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he would take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. So the prayer was take the serpents away, but God didn't answer that prayer. He didn't take the serpents away, he did something else. The Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So in their final test, 
before the promised land, Israel started growing impatient because they didn't like the path they had to take. They didn't like the circumstances. And this grew into frustrations and complaints against God. They didn't like God's guidance. They didn't like his leadership. They didn't like his provision. And the complaints started to spread around Israel like venom through the camp. And so what God did was he essentially materialized what was happening within the people's mouths. You want to spread venom with your complaints, I'm going to give you venom. So God sends fiery serpents, and that term fiery essentially means that the bite of the serpent was like fire shooting up in the bones of the, of the people who got bit. It, it hurt. It was uncomfortable. And when the people realized their wickedness, because grandma got bit because she was complaining, and now her leg is on fire, somebody goes to Moses and says, Moses, we've made a terrible mistake. They realized their wickedness, they repented, and God gave them a cure. And the cure was, Moses, I want you to take a bronze, I want, you to, I want you to make a bronze serpent. I want you to wrap it around a pole, and I want you to raise it up among the people. High, because we're talking probably two million people in this traveling caravan across the desert. I want you to lift this bronze serpent up among the people. It was bronze, so in the summer sun, it just reflected and it had this kind of fiery look to it. And anybody who was bit, didn't matter how many times you were bit, all you had to do was look at that serpent and you were healed. It didn't save you from being bit, but every single person that was bit was healed immediately. Now, if you go back to John 3, verse 14, why did Jesus tell Nicodemus that as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up among the people, and whoever looks at him will have eternal life? Because another serpent had struck and there was a venom running through the veins of not just Israel, but all humanity. And this venom is called sin. And it plagues everybody. Everyone's been bit. The moment you're born, you're bit. And Jesus is teaching Nicodemus, which something that he should have already known, is that this sin that has bitten all mankind in the same way that the fiery serpent shot fire up in the, the body of the people who got bit, this venom of sin, it feels sometimes like a fiery anger in our bones when we don't get what we want. It feels when we're bit by this that there's an unhappiness that we were created poorly or what we have isn't enough or not what somebody else should have, or it looks like gossip, or complaining, or discontentment, or lust, or idolatry, and it runs through the vein of every single per person who's ever lived, because there's a story in the book of Genesis about a serpent who deceived mankind into disobeying God. So just like Moses and the children of Israel had a serpent problem, we have a serpent problem. We have a venom problem. We have a sin problem. But just like there was a cure for Israel in the wilderness, Jesus is telling Nicodemus there is a cure for humanity today. In the same way that, the, that Israel was bitten by serpents, but healed through a serpent, Mankind is cursed with sin, but will also receive healing through a man. The curse came through a serpent, and so they had to behold a serpent. Mankind is plagued with sin, and a man would come and bring the healing for that curse. And in the same way that what Moses lifted up wasn't an actual serpent, it was a bronze representation of the serpent, 
It wasn't a real serpent, it was a representation of it. In the same way, the son of man who knew no sin became sin for us. The one who became a curse, because curse is anyone who hangs from a tree. The one who knew no sin became that for us on the cross. He's a representation of it. He wasn't really it. He had no sin. And in the same way that the serpent was lifted up and invited all Israel to behold and be healed, Jesus was lifted up on a cross And he invites all mankind to look at him and be healed. And that is what this weekend is all about. It's about an empty tomb and an old wooden cross. It's about celebrating the reality that Christ brought healing to this world and one gaze in his direction will change your life forever and heal that cursed sickness deep in your bones, that unhappiness, that anger, that discontentment. Christ is saying, please, just give it to me. Give it my way, right here. I took all that on, and I can take that too. Your unhappiness, your unforgiveness, give it to me, and I will heal you. That's the beauty of this weekend. We're celebrating today that one look changes everything. But, Numbers 21 isn't the end of the story. Israel took that bronze serpent after they wandered in the wilderness and they brought it into the promised land with them. And what started off as a powerful reminder that one look can heal your brokenness ultimately became an idol. I want you to turn to 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 1. In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. This is many, many, many years after the bronze serpent. Many kings, David has come, he's gone, Solomon has come, he's gone. The kingdom is actually split at this period. There's a northern kingdom called Israel. There's a southern kingdom called Judah. Hezekiah is the king of this southern kingdom. Things are much different, but the serpent is still around. The bronze serpent still exists. When Hezekiah, verse two, took the throne, he was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. Now, if you remember, I guess it was two years ago now, we studied through the book of Isaiah. Hezekiah was king at the later part of Isaiah's rule. So if you remember our study in Isaiah, the politics that were going on at the time, this is what's going on with Isaiah and and Hezekiah. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. He removed the high places. What are the high places? High places are points on mountaintops around the region where Israel had made idol worship popular. They had built these tiny shrines to false gods on the top of mountains, and they were worshiping them. One of the first things Hezekiah did when he started bringing religious reform was he destroyed those high places. He broke the pillars on those high places down, and he cut down the Asherah. What is the Asherah? It's this large wooden pole that was a worship ritual to a fertility, a Canaanite fertility god. He cut it down. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. And it was called Nahushtan. Nahushtan is a play on words with two Hebrew words that sound the same, bronze and serpent. 
but the way that they're uh, put together in this word, it's the only place that this Hebrew word exists in the whole Bible, and it's a slang term for what this bronze serpent had become, and it means the bronze thing. It had lost all of its power, but the people were still sacrificing to it. So the bronze serpent followed the children of Israel into the promised land over multiple dynasties. When Solomon finally built his temple, somehow the bronze serpent ended up in the temple. Probably not in a pivotal place when it first started, but it was certainly in a closet somewhere. And eventually somebody took it out of the closet and said, you remember what this thing used to be used for? Maybe we should bring it out and once again look at it. Maybe once again we should... Maybe, maybe, we sh- maybe we should pray to it. Maybe we should, when we come and we bring all our offerings and sacrifices to the other pe- pieces of furniture in the temple, maybe we should also make sure that we tip our hat to the bronze thing. But here's what's interesting to it. Israel started making offerings to this thing, but they, on- they weren't the only ones. Archaeologists have been doing studies and digs in Israel for the last 50 years or so, and you know what they found in the Canaanite region of southern Israel? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tiny little gold serpents wrapped around a pole. The Canaanites, the foreign pagan countries in this region saw what God did and thought that they could capitalize on it by making little versions that they could pray to at home. And Israel, as forerunners, didn't say, guys, what do you, no, don't do that. Worship Yahweh. Look, look at him. They're saying, yeah, that's actually a pretty good idea. I mean, we do that too. And we see that this serpent wrapped around a pole actually starts popping up, not just in local tribes, but out throughout history. All of a sudden, it pops up in Greek mythology. And now it's on ambulances and hospitals. And it's the universal symbol of healing. So my question today on Easter is, if the bronze serpent something God gave the people that pointed them to something greater could be hijacked and misused. And Jesus says that just like the bronze serpent was lifted up, the son of man must be lifted up. If the bronze serpent could be corrupted and meaning injected into it, could we also be struggling with the same thing with the cross? Is there a way in our modern society that we could use the cross in similar idolatrous ways? Is there a way that we could look at that thing and behold its beauty, but only on our terms? And only when we need it. Is there a way to treat the cross, this symbol that's been given to us, as a thing that when you look at the promises that your sins will be washed away, that's not necessarily the most important thing for us. I don't need all my sins washed away. I just need this guilt for this bad decision I made to be washed away. And so I'm going to offer sacrifices to that thing in the form of going to church or paying a tithe or opening that Bible I haven't read in years. Is there a way that that thing, that cross can become an idol and used as a watermark in our society to confuse what Christ is actually associated with? Is there a way that that thing can be hijacked and used over certain policies or organizations or political campaigns when the person has no connection to the risen Christ or what that cross symbolizes, but they know that it plays well with a certain group of people, so they use it? Is there a way that that cross could be put over buildings with the title church, but what is talked about and and the way the people are discipled inside has nothing to do with what Christ taught, but that, that cross is a nice symbol that reinforces good things inside of us, and so what we want to use it for is a way to spread love, but not ask people to turn from their sins to a holy God who wants to give them eternal life. 
My point is that we as humanity have a long history of repurposing God's symbols in selfish ways. And I bet if you sit here for a minute, you could think of three or four. Three or four symbols that God gave humanity and said, here is a promise that I will make to humanity. And then humanity takes that and injects it with new meaning and uses it however they want. And there's no connection to how it was originally given. Do you remember a story, well not a story, but a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth about the way they were treating communion? Communion was, was a gift, it was given to you to remember what Christ did on your behalf and you're turning it into an idolatrous meal. And that's why some of you are sick and even dying because you're not treating this thing the way it was meant to be treated. All these things are given to us as gifts, just like miracles, to point to something greater. But if you inject your own meaning into those symbols, they're gonna point to something, but not the greater thing. And since we have this long history of repurposing God's symbols in selfish ways, I just wonder if it's worth considering on Resurrection Day. Does the cross still stand for death and suffering and sorrow, and healing, and new life, and forgiveness? Or does the cross stand for license to do whatever you want, but to soothe your conscience as a place to go once things break down and they don't head the way you thought they would? Are we treating this like a medicine and not a cure? A thing that covers our symptoms, but never really addresses the core issue? Are we treating this as a thing that we bring our families to and we tell them is important, but never really buries on the inside core of who we are and informs our entire worldview? Is it a symbol of healing that we are plagued with sin and it has the, alone has the way to heal us, or is it a decoration that never disagrees with us or never demands anything from us? On this resurrection day, my goal is to make much of Jesus. That in the same way Jesus talked to Nicodemus about how the serpent was raised up in the wilderness and anyone who looked at it was healed, I want us to understand that that is what is being done today, that Jesus is being magnified and lifted high, and anyone in this place, if you are plagued with sin, you can look at him and be healed. If you came in here today with, from a polite invitation that somebody that you love said, hey, will you come to church, it is Easter, and you're like, all right, I'll come. I want you to know that there is an invitation for you today to hear the good news of Jesus, to turn your back on the things that are offered from this world that never really satisfy, and, in, and, and for the first time maybe in your entire life, taste of things that really do satisfy. But I want you to understand that that is the message of the cross. It is not a message to come, a, come to Jesus and get a better version of what you have now. The message of Jesus is come to this cross and die. If anybody, anybody wants to follow me, they must first deny themselves and then take up their cross and follow me. This is the invitation to turn your back on the way you think things should be and trust a God who has a better perspective on you on the way he orders life. To let yourself off the hook of having to have an answer for everything and trust by faith that God is working his plan and his plan is infinitely better than anything you could come up with on your very best day. The invitation is that we have not finally come in human history to a generation that has finally figured it out and the last 6,000 years, all they've done is done it wrong. The invitation is come to the cross and say, it is your way, not my way. I turn and repent. That is the invitation. But I worry. I worry that that's not what that really means in our culture anymore. And I, and I worry that maybe even the invitation to come to church 
might have been predicated off of the idea that that cross is injected with meaning, it doesn't actually hold. So the question today is, does that cross still hold the same healing power in your eyes or has it become nothing more than a bronze or a wooden thing that you wear around your neck or you hang on your walls or you cross yourself with or whatever you wanna do, you wanna put it over your business to let people know. However you wanna use it, you're injecting it with meaning. If you're honest with yourself, you're injecting it with meaning that it, it doesn't hold, that it never held, that you're making it do something that it wasn't intended for, that its sole purpose is to magnify the Lordship of Jesus Christ and his healing power, and what you want from it is to have your own way. So the invitation today is for all of us to consider what does that cross really mean on this Easter day? And then for some of us it is, what does that cross mean in my own life? Because when I look at it, and I hear what you're saying, that demands something of me and I have to respond. I stumbled across a quote, I don't regularly use quotes uh, while I'm teaching, but this one, it just kinda got under my skin and I haven't been able to shake it. So I wanna leave you with this. It's not necessarily what we're talking about, but it's kind of adjacent and I think it drives home what I'm trying to say. It's a quote by this guy named A.W. Tozer. And he says this, Every man is as full of the Spirit as he wants to be. He may not be as full as he wishes he were, but he is most certainly as full as he wants to be. You might have just as much of the cross as you want because you don't feel comfortable with it treading on corners of your life that you don't want to let go of. And I'm telling you that you have just as much of the cross as you want but there is so much more being offered. Let's pray.